Hello, my name is Dr. Okira Richard. We are going to talk about piercing thorax pains. A 35 year old soldier who is a smoker presented with severe piercing thorax pain that gets worse on inspiration. He feels weak and has soft febrile temperature. What, what are you thinking about? What are your differential diagnoses and how you go up about solving them? Well, I'm thinking about a pericarditis, myocarditis, or pericardiomyocarditis. Also, I consider a myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolism, or pulmonary infarction is a differential diagnosis. Also, pneumonia with associated pleuritis. I will require for an ECG while doing a parallel body examination, looking for signs of elevated jugular pressure. Looking for per peripheral edema, pulmonary congestion, heart rate with auscultation. In auscultation, I look for signs of pericard pericardial or pleural rub. I'll take a history and blood test. In the history, <clears throat> I look for cardiova cardiovascular risk factors, look for time and process of development of the complaint, and also history of a possible cold or flu before the uh, symptom, I look for the relation of the symptoms to body exertions. I will also ask for dyspnea or exertional dyspnea. In the blood test, I will do basic blood tests like full blood count, CRP, but additionally I will do troponin, CK, D-dimer electrolyte and creatinine. Now, the patient tells you that he had a cold for three weeks ago, which only lasted for two days, and he started working thereafter. Apart and after that, he has not been able to work well. He gets still has exertional dyspnea. Apart from smoking, there are no other atherogenic risk factors. He doesn't have exertional dyspnea really. On examination, his general condition was okay. BMI 23, blood pressure 100 over 60, temperature 38.8 degrees centigrade, jugular vein uh, venous pressure was okay, the lung, lungs were free, pulse were regular 68 per minute, there were significant signs of pericardial rubs, and there were no edema, uh, edema. nothing on abdominal on urological examination. And the ECG presented to you showed sinus rhythm 80 per minute left as it hello my name is Dr. Slight, Dr. Uh, slight I'm doing ST segment of elevation in and, uh, 3 AVF B5 and B6 is a new development. what do you do? I must put on more about this I will do an echocardiography okay the echocardiography shows a normal left ventricular cytolic pump function do the some website, some website, and look at the views, not optimal, but we could see signs of inferior hypokinesia. The left ventricle was moving in atrophy. There was light left atrial and right atrial to be on the sun. Right ventricle was normal. Aortic root was also normal. The aortic root was a bit slower. With normal movement, no insufficiency or stenosis, no pericardial effusion. If you have an alcohol, it's normal. Your good respiratory modulation. What is most likely diagnosis? Well, both diagnoses are still possible. In perimyocarditis, you can have diffuse hypokinesia, sometimes regional hypokinesia, or a regional uh, left ventricular systolic function. Sometimes you can still see pericardial effusion. But note that a normal echocardiographic finding does not rule out a perimyocarditis or an acute coronary event, that is a myocardial infarction. So because we are seeing a, an inferior hypokinesia and ST segment elevation in 2-3 AVF. Also with the background of arteriogenous 
uh, risk factor with of with nicotine abuse and positive family history i think we have to either exclude or confirm the st elevation myocardial infarction so what are you going to do i will issue uh, administer Aspizol, that is soluble aspirin, 500 mg intravenously. Also give 5,000 international units of heparin and 4 mg of morphine intravenously. Um, if the patient is still having complaints now with thorax medicine, I will give additional, additionally, clopidogrel or prasugrel an order for a head catheter, a cardiac catheterization, coronary angiography. Okay, in the coronary ang angiography, the vent ventriculography showed a regional inferomedial hypokinesia with normal legs, left ventricular function, and the coronary angiography did not show any relevant stenosis. Let me ask you a question. What can you tell me something about the type, the um, difference between the ST elevation in acute myocardial infarction? And that's in acute pericarditis. In acute pericarditis, the ST elevation, they are not visually restricted to inferior or um, anterior walls. And two, there are no reciprocal ST depressions, ST changes. The ST elevation usually begin in the rule direct after the J point and are usually rarely higher than 5 millimeters. Most time concave and also most time they don't have a simultaneous T wave inversion. Could you tell me something about the ST segment elevation in early repolarization? Okay, here the LST elevation in region of the J point. They have normal configuration usually in V3 to V6. Then something to note is that the ratio of ST elevation to T wave amplitude in V6 when above 0.24 it is an acute pericarditis. This was a publication by Klatsky et al. 2003. Now you have the lab results uh, with light Lightly elevated leukocytosis, um, troponin T is all slightly elevated, and CRP is all slightly elevated. So I think that is an acute pericarditis. Good. So could you tell me about the possible etiology of an acute pericarditis? Which one is more likely? And what examination do you think is wise? So in the etiology, it could be infectious, vir that is a virus, bacterial, it could be autoreactive. Uh, in, ter in terms of virus, you talk about adenovirus, enterocytomegalovirus, influenza, hepatitis B, and HSV, epicimplex virus. Bacteria can also cause it tuberculosis and fungi. You can also have autoreactive causes like, like vasculitis, collagen, collagen vascular disease, system, systemic diseases. Also, some organic condition like myocardial infarction, pleuritis, pneumonia can also cause this. Endocrine diseases, for example, uremia, neoplastic diseases can also cause this. So neoplastic conditions like breast cancer, lung cancers, and melanomas can also cause this. So you can also have traumatic causes, and some cases are unclear. But I would like to say in this case, because of the history, I would rather I will it's most likely going to be a viral the viral cause. Um, it is also worthy of note that the viral causes and the idiopathic causes are with long distance the most common causes of acute pericarditis. So additionally, I will do a, an x-ray of the chest to check for infiltrations or malig uh, malignity, also to exclude tuberculosis. Um, HIV testing should be done, 
also tighter for anti-nuclear antibody because of fever of the above 38.5 due to blood culture too. The patient has to be monitored and a, con a col control and I repeat echocardiography should be done. Okay, in, okay, in the monitoring, some few ventricular extrasystoles we have seen without successive form like uh, bigeminy or couplets. And in the repeat echocardiography three days later, we saw very little pericardial effusion. Let me ask you another question. How do you determine the hemodynamic relevance of pericardial effusion? Do you know echocardiographic criteria? Well, um, actually, pericardial tamponade can be determined by clinical examination, checking for elevated jugular venous pressure, tachycardia, and dyspnea, and sometimes shock symptoms. Uh, but in the echocardiography, the pericardial effusion should be examined in all axes, and the maximum uh, pericardial effusion sites in endiastolic phase with M mode in parasternal lung axis should be documented. In that axis, pericardial effusion below one centimeter is small. Between be, between one and two centimeter is middle medium. And above two centimeter is severe. The findings in ta a pericardial tamponade: you have swinging hearts, compression, and diastolic collapse of the right, sometimes also the left heart chambers. They are signs of liver 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 vein congestion, and also restricted respiratory variability of the vena cava inferior. In Doppler. In Doppler of, uh, across the mitral valve, there is an increased respiratory variabi variability in the trans uh, mitral Doppler profile. That means there's an inspiratory fall of E wave, more than 25%. Also, there's an inspiratory increase in the tricuspid inflow sp speed. We have over more than 40% as demonstrated by Bock et al. 2009. But according to European Society of Cardiology uh, um, guidelines, pericardial effusion are classified according to Horowitz classification. According to Horowitz, guideline on the diagnosis and management of pericardial disease, 2004. Clinically, you have elevated venous pressure, hypotension, pulsus paradosus, tachycardia, dyspnea or tachypnea, or pulmonary conjunction. Well, under the predisposing factors, you talk about medicines like cyclosporine, anticoagulation, thrombolytic, etc. Also, you look for long, uh, short heart operation, recent heart operation, catheters, thorax trauma, malignancy, collagen diseases, and renal failure and sepsis. Under ECG, it is, ECG could be normal or with unspecific changes, could also have electrical alternance. Bradycardia, electromechanic dissociation is an end phase. And the X-ray findings, you could have an enlarged heart or enlarged heart shadow with, with or without pulmonary congestion. In the echocardiography, you have a diastolic collapsing right ventricle free wall, right atrial collapse, left atrium and very sometimes very, very seldom left ventricle collapse. You could also have a pseudo hypertrophy. That that is a left ventricular wall hypertrophy in diastole. You could have a wide vena, inferior vena cover with missing respiratory modulation and a swinging heart. In the Doppler echocardiography, you are going to see an inspiratory rise, increase in flow across the tricuspid valve and the fall 
inflow across the mitral valve. There is going, also going to be reduced systolic and diastolic flow in the great veins during expiration. And the, and the return flow during atrial contraction will be raised. In the cardiac catheterization, you have to, that way you want first of all do one, confirmation of the diagnosis and the quantification of the degree of hemodynamic relevance. That means you are going to see a raised right atrial pressure, also a raised intrapericardial pressure, which will be identical with the right atrial pressure. The right ventricular mid diastolic pressure will be raised, which, which will also be like that of the right atrial pressure and the intrapericardial pressure. There will, not, there, will, there will be no deep plateau configuration. The pulmonary artery pressure will be slightly elevated. The pulmonary capillary, capillary well, web pressure will be also raised and very close or identical to that of the right, pressure, right atrial pressure and the intrapericardial pressure. Well, the systolic right, left ventricular and, and atrial pressure will be normal or lightly reduced. Also, in the heart, heart catheterization, apart from the confirmation of diagnosis, you also do the documentation of the hemodynamic improvement after aspiration. Three, you also do Evidence of coexisting hemodynamic abnormalities like heart insufficiency, constriction, and pulmonary hypertension. And four, you also show evidence of coexisting cardiovascular sicknesses like coronary heart disease or cardiomyopathies. Still on Horowitz classification, in the left, right ventricular stroke, left vent ventricular angiography, you will see atrial collapse and small hyperdynamic ventricle in the coronary angiography you do coronary compression you will see coronary compression in diastolic diastole also also in the horovitz table you do, in the computer tomography you will not see the sub epicardial fats around the ventricles so, thank you very much. Let's return to your patient. By your patient, you have a very slight secular pericardial effusion only without hemodynamic relevance. In the laboratory test, the infection parameters are lightly raised and the other findings were okay. The patient still has complaint. What are you going to do therapeutically for this patient? Well, aspirin or NSAID ibuprofen, for example, is usually very helpful in viral or idiopathic acute pericarditis. If after a week the patient is not free from the symptom, then we have to, we have to think of other causes. Ibuprofen is usually given with, uh, as on a dose of 300 to 800 milligram, three to four times daily for days to weeks depending on symptoms alternatively you give aspirin 800 milligram three to four times daily for three to four weeks colchicine 0.5 to 1 milligram per day can be given as monotherapy or a combination with NSAIDs glucocorticoids can also be given when NSAID and cochetin are not working and when a specific cause has been excluded. Note that in acute pericarditis from connective tissue diseases, autoimmune pericarditis or uremic pericarditis, the recommended dose is 1 mg per kilogram per day and the dose has to be reduced fast. Thank you very much. My next question is what do you advise your patient to do? Do you think he has to be admitted? Um, I will about, about advise the patient to take a rest, to take the med medical treatment as stated above. The pro prognosis on the long run is very good in ac acute viral or idiopathic pericarditis. Pericardial tamponade is a very extremely seldom complication. And I have to explain 
about the symptoms of this to the patient. A constrictive pericarditis can occur in 1% of the cases and usually with specific causes. In the most cases, acute pericarditis can be handled without problem on an outpatient basis. But don't forget that clinical examination, laboratory uh, examination, elect ECG, and echocardiographic follow up are very necessary. But according to publication of Imazio et al. 2004 2007, patients with high risk should be admitted. And these patients with high risk are those with fever and fever above 38 degrees Celsius and leukocytosis. Patients where eventually you expect a tamponet or a, grow, a big pericardial effusion. Patients with existing immune suppression. Patients with oral anticoagulation. And patients with a elevated cardiac enzyme markers. Thank you very much. Now your patient comes back after six weeks for controlled echocardiography, examination and blood tests as you required and he told you that after taking those medications the symptoms resided completely and he stopped the medicines after three weeks but he just realized now that since one week the symptoms are coming back again with the same uh, chest pain and the same chest pain he felt six weeks ago you did an echocardiography and you found a progressive pericardial effusion, secular, without hemodynamic relevance. What do you think is happening? Well, it's either of two things. It's either a recurrent pericarditis or a persistent of the last one. So how do you define this disease condition? Well, where recurrent pericarditis usually occur weeks, this year, beyond or up, sometimes up to years, but normally within 20 months after the first presentation with the same symptoms. You have two types of recurrent pericarditis. You have the intermittent type and the incessant type. In the intermittent type, the, you have symptom-free intervals without treatment. But in the incessant type, you have recurrence of the symptom after discontinuation of the therapy. About half of the patients have one to two recurrence in their life. But there are also some people that have regular recurrence over decades. The prognosis is generally good. And with the idiopathic pericarditis with recurrence, there is no association, association with constrictive pericarditis. Complications like tamponade is usually very, very seldom. In the core study 2005, the definition of recurrent pericarditis is documentation of acute pericarditis with recurrent symptoms or a persistent active pericarditis needs the following to be diagnosed. Criteria for recurrence, you have new pains and at least one of the following criteria, fever, pericardial rub, ECG changes, pericardial effusion in echocardiography, little cytosis, erythromet uh, raised erythrocyte sedimentation rates or raised CRP. According to European Society of Cardiology guidelines, the treatment of recurrent pericarditis goes again like that of an acute pericarditis, as stated earlier. When there is difficulty in management, according to the Task Force on Pericardial Diseases of the European Society of Cardiolo Cardio 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 Cardiology, you may need to do a pericardioscopy, which is a class 2A indication and multiple epicardial biopsies. You take pump, uh, um, pump effusion and 
you take a fusion and test and check for lymphocytes, monocytes, count, tuberculosis, borrelia, chlamydia, and other pathogen with use of PCRO culture. Also check for infectious activities in epicardial and myocardial biopsy. Look for cytology, also do cytological examination of the effusions and the biopsy. Check for systemic and metabolic conditions and uremia. So in summary, please tell me again your therapeutic options and recommendations. Okay, ibuprofen, alternatively aspirin, like you do by pericarditis, also you may give colchicine according to core and COP study. Look, corticoid, when possible, please avoid. Because there's a, there are, there's an indication of increased recurrence after glucocorticoid therapy. But when not necessary, you give high dose therapy with 1 to 1.5 mg per kg per day for, five, for one month. Then you reduce the dose slowly under clinical and laboratory, laboratory control. Some, you may also need to give an intrapericardial glucocorticoid. But this one has a very high complication rate because of the application form. Azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, intravenously, hemoglobulin can also be given, but the, the papers here are too few. Note that pericardial synthesis, a pericardial puncture by tamponade is, can save life. Eviden evidence level B, class 1 indication and it is indicated by pericardial effusion more than two centimeter end diastolic measurement in M mode. When the pericardial effusion is less than two centimeters, this is not indicated unless when you need it for diagnostic purposes, but note that the complications are high. Please, you have to explain to the patient carefully, especially when this is an elective procedure and when there is no Heart surgeon. That means when you are in the setting without a heart surgeon, the main complication here is an aortic dissection. The contra the contraindications here are uncorrected coagulopathy, anticoagulation therapy, thrombocyte count less than fifty thousand, small posterior pericardial effusion, localized pericardial effusion. So finally, let me read the. Guidelines on the diagnosis and management of pericardial diseases, auscultation, pericardial rub, ECG, stage 1, anterior and inferior concave ST, segment elevation, PRO, depression. Early stage 2, ST segment normal, normalized, PRO, reduced. Late stage 2. Flat T wave and inversion. Stage 3 generalized T wave negative, ne negativity. And stage 4 normal ECG. Echocardiography, pericardial efficient type B to D, according to Horowitz, or tamponade signs. Laboratory, raised uh, CRP and leukocytosis. Heart enzymes also elevated. Chest X X ray may be normal to bag shaped heart.